Hey everybody, welcome back to The Filmist. Um, today I'm rather excited, we've got a few things to go through in terms of pickups, and then I've got some news that I finally want to go ahead and just lay out on the table, lay it bare, that I've been uh, alluding to like a small child the last few videos that I've made. Um, the few pickups that I have this week are, it's a little bit of a smaller haul, but the items themselves are actually quite large, and uh, there's a lot of excitement behind one of them in particular. So I can't wait to get to it. I'll be unboxing it and finding out what's inside and talking about its presentation kind of sight unseen. Uh, and the other three are kind of just sort of adjacent to it, um, but they're also rather impressive as well. So let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I haven't done one of these in a long time. Uh, and then I'll uh, solicit you further at the end. Alright everybody, so this is it. This is the World of Wong Kar Wai, as released by the Criterion Collection. Uh, this is the day it's just come out, so I'm along for this ride with you now. Before we get into it, let's go ahead and express, uh, or let's go ahead and mention at the very least the elephant in the room, which is the new color timing for a lot of the films. Uh, this is an issue that, as I'm seeing, it's already confronted right here directly on the cover. As you, can, you can see screenshots from the films that have been made into kind of like a mosaic collage for the cover, which I really like, by the way. Um, and I actually kind of like the new coloring, um, for reasons I'll get into in a little bit. But, let's um, dive in. So, what we're seeing first up, and I'll show you the spine here as well. This is a rather large set. It's a bit smaller than the Ingmar Bergman cinema set, but I think it might be around the same size in terms of height as the Agnivarda set, or maybe a little bit taller. Uh, and it's a teeny bit uh, less wide, I'll say. So our first step, this is a rather intriguingly constructed set, which I love when Criterion does this, personally. Uh, we'll slide back their version of a J card, you know, this set, uh, already I can tell you it just looks beautiful. Like, look, look at the artwork here, you know, I mean, it's, this whole set is constructed in such an ingenious way. It's, it's, the set itself is a work of art. Now, it's constructed almost like an envelope, as you can see, with, uh, different impressionistic pieces from each of the films, and it folds out like a Chinese puzzle to reveal, uh, First up, a mammoth book here, which, uh, like the rest of the set, is covered in uh, artwork that is full of deep reds, purples, uh, pinks, greens, of course, and uh, artwork from the film that is uh, reproduced here with the new color timing. And so if we go through, we see that there are notes in the film, uh, various screenshots, our contents page, um, Everything from his tears go by down to 2046, and then we get a 26-page essay, Like the Most Beautiful Times, by John Powers, who's always fantastic. We have the director's note, which uh, has been passed around online previously, uh, concerns uh, our new color timing and a choice uh, to do it that way. We also get, all throughout the book, uh, these little Easter eggs here, which are photo reproductions. Here, I'll take one out for us to take a look at. Very, very carefully, haha. <laughs> which are photo reproductions of uh, certain specific moments of each of the films. Uh, that's, that's really cool. I like that quite a bit. So, this is just huge. The pages are double bound, as you'll sometimes see in uh, folio books and things like that. Um, this is just beautiful. On the front, of course, we have uh, a shot from In the Mood for Love, um, and then on the back, I believe, that is Fallen Angels, I believe, I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've seen Fallen Angels. Now, having removed the book, what we're looking at here is the container for the films themselves. I've had to move things around because this set is actually uh, an experience itself. It's an art piece itself. It's meant to be displayed, and so it comes in layers, uh, each of which are rather large. So this is our container course for the films, our film book, so to speak, and it's constructed kind of in that way, uh, with artwork from the films with the new color timing. Uh, I'm going to cut now to uh, 
a full tilt shot or a full display shot of everything because I don't want to have to show y'all uh, or submit y'all to my fumbling around. So, so first we take a look here. Uh, you flip through, and of course it's constructed much like a book with beautiful artwork reproduced from the films. You have In the Mood for Love right here. Now if you fold out, here's where the fun comes in. This is how our films are displayed, and much like the rest of the set, it's intentionally constructed like a jigsaw puzzle, you see. Uh, you have As Tears Go By, In the Mood for Love, here in the middle as a centerpiece almost, I think, and then 2046 uh, next to it, it's sequel. Uh, and more. We have Days of Being Wild beneath that, and another layer, Chung King Express, which um, it's going to be really funny seeing the, um, the sharks on eBay and Amazon who are trying to sell their Blu-ray copies for upwards of $200, $300, uh, now find themselves faced with um, the fact that it's back in print, although they might still have a market for it, considering what we'll get into after we look at the physical contents of the set. We also have Fallen Angels and Happy Together, so this is, this is an immaculate set here. There's everything that you could ever want. In a Wong Kar Wai set, this is this is, it's insane how immaculate this is, and I don't mean to sound like a fanboy, of course, for Criterion, but well, I am a fanboy for Criterion. Now let's pull out to that full shot I was talking about. So first we take a look here. Uh, you flip through, and of course it's constructed much like a book, with beautiful artwork reproduced from the films. You have In the Mood for Love right here. Now if you fold out, here's where the fun comes in. This is how our films are displayed, and much like the rest of the set, it's intentionally constructed like a jigsaw puzzle, you see. Uh, you have As Tears Go By, In the Mood for Love, here in the middle, as a centerpiece almost, I think, and then 2046 uh, next to it, it's sequel. Uh, and more. We have Days of Being Wild beneath that, and another layer, Chung King Express, which um, it's going to be really funny seeing the... Um, the sharks on eBay and Amazon who are trying to sell their Blu-ray copies for upwards of $200, $300 uh, now find themselves faced with um, the fact that it's back in print, although they might still have a market for it considering what we'll get into after we look at the physical contents of the set. We also have Fallen Angels and Happy Together, so this is this is an immaculate set here. There's everything that you could ever want in a Wong Kar Wai set. This is, this is, it's insane how immaculate this is, and I don't mean to sound like a fanboy, of course, for Criterion, but, well, I am a fanboy for Criterion. Now let's pull out to that full shot I was talking about. So that's our Wong Kar Wai set. Uh, that's a rather uh, minor run-through of its physical contents. Let's go take a look briefly uh, at its at its content contents and its supplemental contents. You know, we have uh, 4K digital restorations of everything from Chunking Express, Fallen Angels, Happy Together, In the Mood for Love, and 2046. Let's go ahead and hold it up for the camera like I'm a professional or something. Uh, approved by director Wong Kar Wai. Uh, there are new 4K digital restorations of As Tears Go By and Days of Being Wild. Uh, there's a new program in which Wong answers questions submitted by authors uh, Andre Asiman and Jonathan Latham, filmmakers Sophia Coppola, Rian Johnson, Lisa Joy, and Chloe Zhao, who you know, has had so much success this year for uh, Nomadland. Cinematographers Philip the Sword and Bradford Young, and filmmakers and founders, creative directors of Rudard, Kate, and Laura, and Laura Mulevi. There's an alternate version of Days of Being Wild, which is on home video now for the home uh, for the first time. An extended version of The Hand, which is a short film by Wong Kar Wai from 2004, first time available in the U.S. Hua, I'm so sorry, Hua Yang Di Nian Hua, a short film from 2000 by Wong, interview in Cinema Lesson with Wong from 2001. This is stacked. This is, this is amazing. This, they're much like the actual physical presentation of the set itself. There are layers and layers to the supplemental content. Criterion has, has really outdone themselves. This is, this is amazing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even done yet. There are more interviews. Uh, several programs featuring interviews with Wong, cinematographer Christopher Doyle, act actors Maggie Chung, Man Yuk, Tony Leung Chu Wai, Chang Chin, Fei Wong, and Zai Zhang, and others. Program from 2012 on In the Mood for Love soundtrack, deleted scenes, alternate endings, behind the scenes footage, a promo reel, music videos, and trailers, plus, of course, deluxe packaging, including a perfect bow and French fold. That was the phrase I was looking for, thank you. 
book featuring lavish photography and an essay. That essay, that's 26 pages by John Powers, a director's note, and six collectible art prints, which are inside the book. Um, this is astounding, because there's so much new content here, I believe, on this set that hasn't been seen before, of course, in the films that Criterion hasn't released. Um, and there's also uh, archival content from the Chungking Express, although we do lose on from both In the Mood for Love and the Chungking Express releases Tony Rain's commentaries. Uh, if you own the home releases of either one of those films, in particular Chungking Express, uh, keep them just for that. Otherwise, this is... It's immaculate in their selection, in the curation of this set, in its presentation, its physical presentation, which is just beautiful. I really, really love this. I really love this. And of course, now... Let's talk about the elephant in the room, as it were, before we get on to our other pickups, so to speak. Uh, the color grading, the color timing. Uh, this is a sticky moral issue, I think, for uh, both, you know, film lovers, historians, and filmmakers themselves. By the way, I do apologize for that. It's a bed that we picked up for somebody. Um, here's my opinion on it, just briefly. I'm about two minds. Because I do believe that the original versions of the film should be preserved, because those are the ones that kind of stick in people's memories, you know, right or wrong. That's film preservation. But, on the other hand, uh, ethically, I, I really, really enjoy, no matter what comes out of it, I enjoy when a director goes back and takes another look at their work and, you know, plays with it. And there's that malleability, and they're able to present it, like in this case, and also like with Memories of Murder, uh, which is going to be released next month, which uh, there's the same debate going on. They're able to present it uh, either as originally intended or um, or closer to how they originally intended, uh, or because they're seeing it in a new way, they're able to present it in a new way. And that, that's, 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 that's fascinating, and I'm always going to come down on that side, right or wrong, as long as the original versions are still preserved. That's the one thing I think is missing from this set, uh, is just the original color timings as well. You could have them side by side, you know. Um, but as it stands, um, In the Mood for Love is still widely available as a single disc release in Criterion, and I do believe that the Kino logo releases of Fallen Angels and uh, Days of Being Wild, I think, are still widely available, or, I mean, they're out, they're out of print, but you can still find them. Um, and Chungking Express is going to come down in price since this is available now. So, I like the green. I like the green uh, cast. It really brings out, I think, um, some of the lushness of the colors. And a lot of the choices that I've uh, taken a peek at and um, also that I've seen online in the time since. Um, you know, the the colors in Wong Kar Wai's films are always... Uh, uh, these beautiful evocations of the emotional interior lives of the characters and the drama they're going through. You know, it's that interiority that I keep mentioning as a buzzword. Uh, and so much of his film is filled with that color, and it's not just lush romantic color for lush romantic color's sake. Um, it's, it's a psychological use of color. And I think, Though a lot of the uses of color in some of these remasters are a little bit different, um, that still remains. And there's new meaning now to them with the choices of different colors that he's using and the different, uh, uh, or, or lack thereof, of color in certain places. Um, so I like that quite a bit, and I really, really like how they look. Uh, the green just gives everything such a, even more than before, and you know, I've always been a big fan of, green hues, but it gives everything more than before, even, almost like a dreamlike feeling, which I think for certain of these films, uh, really works. So, that is our review of the Wong Kar Wai Criterion set, long anticipated, and, uh, well worth the wait. I am very glad that I picked this up on the day of release. This is just fantastic. A1 Criterion, this might be my favorite home release of this year, so far. It's beautiful. And now on to everything else, uh, which we'll go through more briefly. This was a set kind of week, I think. And so the first other set that I want to talk about very, very briefly is uh, this was on special on Amazon, and I had to pick it up. I've been uh, I've been thinking about picking it up for a long time. Eureka's 
Buster Keaton, the complete short films uh, in their Masters of Cinema series. This is a wonderful, wonderful set. Look at this. It's, uh, it's, it's about as bulky, uh, if not a little bulkier, than the Wong Kar Wai set. Uh, let's go ahead and slip things out and see how they look. So, we have three uh, Blu-ray cases here. Uh, and these, I think, the special features are kind of parsed out over the three discs, and so uh, this is everything from The Butcher Boy down to Moonshine, with uh, special Blu-ray features alternating for Coney Island, preservationist uh, Sergei Bromberg, introduction, uh, this is Goodnight Nurse to Convict 13. Special features include uh, commentaries by Joseph McBride, who's always fantastic, uh, a new essay by critic and filmmaker David Carnes, who's also always fantastic. Uh, Life with Buster Keaton, which is um, Keaton reenacting uh, Fatty Arbuckle's Salem Dance, performing The Cook. And finally, even more, uh, From the Scarecrow to the Love Nest, that's 1920-23. And then special edition, or special features include a pre-release version of The Blacksmith, which is fascinating. We get archival commentaries by McBride again on three of the films. Uh, another alternate ending from My Wife's Relations, The Art of Buster Keaton, which is Pierre Ite, or Itaz, discussing uh, Keaton's style. Uh, and his films are also fascinating as well, and I would advise everybody to go pick his films up if you could. And an audio recording of Keaton at a party in 1962. How cool. And of course, uh, there is a book. A book, not a booklet, a book easier, you know, um, filled with essays. Uh, let's take a look at the contents. Look at this. Uh, this is insane. This is insane. This might be one of the finest sets that I've seen in a while as well. Uh, and I think it's actually the first big set, big set that I have from Eureka. I do have a few of their other uh, standout uh, single film releases. Uh, you have notes on each of the films. You have notes from film critics writing from Buster Keaton himself or interviews with him. Uh, you know, this is, this is, this is astounding. Um, and Buster Keaton is one of my idols in terms of filmmaking. You know. Um, he is the progenitor of the action film. He is one of the, uh, he is one of the strongest examples of the, of of action, visual storytelling, um, the, you know, the pure emotion, I think, of, um, what's possible through, through, uh, through telling stories, through set pieces, uh, and I'm not gonna say he's better than Chaplin, like I think certain, um, film critics do, but I, I do personally rate him higher than Chaplin myself, uh, The General is one of the masterpieces of cinema, and behind it, of course, there's the cameraman. You know, uh, it's just that Sherlock Jr., Steamboat Bill Jr. And this right here, this is fascinating because... Uh, and you can also find these Region A here through Kino Lorber. Uh, but you have... You're watching the development of an artist uh, from early pantomime into the, the, uh, the influential master that he became. You know, he, he's influenced everybody from George Miller to Jackie Chan to Steven Spielberg. I mean, everybody. Almost every action film, uh, uh, among other things, bear his mark. You know, uh, this, sit, this set, rather, is an important set. Um, pick it up if you can. It's running at a reduced price on Amazon right now. And it is an essential uh, piece for anyone who is a fan of Great Stone Face, or Old Stone Face, rather. So that's one. The next set that I want to talk about is uh, actually used, um, but I was astounded to find it out in the wild because I've been looking for it for a long time, and it goes for exorbitant prices because it's actually out of print. This is the Carl Teal Dreyer set uh, from Criterion, only released on DVD, and it's an older imprint, as you can tell from the logo, uh, spine number 124. Um, this is the only place, as you, you can tell, it's used because we do have uh, some minor stainers here that I believe is probably removable, so I'm going to be repairing this set personally. Uh, but I found this 
at, oh, and then of course there's foxing on the edge here. Um, all this is totally fine for the price that I found this, this at and what it usually goes for, which I <clears throat> uh, would have spent from some of the more reasonable places, but um, I always had a feeling that I'd find it in the wild, and I'm so happy that I did. Carl Tito Dreyer is one of my favorite directors of the silent era, and I... I'm a huge fan of every film in this box. I haven't seen my Michier uh, yet, the documentary about him, but I'm a huge fan of um, Orday and Day of Wrath. I love those two films so much. So, so much. Uh, Gertrude, I'm not so much of a fan of, um, but I do understand what he was trying to do with it, and I'm probably going to give it another look at some point. Uh, it's intentionally stagey, which there's a reason for it, um, but I was not as much a fan of that as I was of uh, these two films, or Day in particular, which is one of the strongest films about religion that I think I've ever seen. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the films themselves really fast. So, of course, uh, these are presented in Criterion's uh, old, older style uh, of box sets. You have, of course... Uh, this, this is stacked, and I really wish they would reissue this in Blu-ray, but I think they've lost the rights to certain of his films. Uh, you have special features. Uh, we have a 22-page booklet, a biographical essay of Dwight Scarler, Ed Van Kahl, uh, rare interview footage and archival material. Uh, you know, on Day of Wrath, you have deleted footage of interviews from uh, My Meteor with uh, Elizabeth Mulvin and Preben Lerdorf Rye. I'm really sorry, you guys. I'm... I'm you know, um, and of course the uh, covers are uh, snapshots from the films themselves. You know, uh, Gertrude has um, more footage from Emitier, archival footage from the time of Gertrude's production. You know, uh, and finally Orday, which is has the same, uh, although it does have a new transfer that was uh, supervised by Henning Vinson. Deleted footage of from My Meteor, and so on. Um, there is, it should be said, a Region B set released from uh, the BFI, uh, British Film Institute, uh, but I've heard mixed things about that. It does include some of his other earlier short films and his uh, war films and things like that, uh, but these three are the preeminent ones that I've uh, loved, watched, and that I studied in school. And so it's nice to come back to them now, finally. And also, of course, there is a part of me that is a Criterion junkie. It's like, oh my god, hey, you know, it fits into the collection so well because I have uh, three of his other films that have been released on Blu-ray that aren't in this set, his silent films. Uh, you know, uh, well, Vampire is not silent, but it's basically a silent film, Passion of Joan of Arc, uh, and Master of the House. So Carl Tito Dreyer was, um, and is, one of the preeminent uh, directors in the Danish film lexicon, you know, he's been influential on everybody from Lars von Trier in his home country, uh, to Martin Scorsese here, and all the way down the line, especially Passion of Joan of Arc, but uh, with his other films as well, especially Vampire, which you can see remnants of uh, in Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, as well as some of the, uh, even some of the more modern directors, like uh, Robert Eggers and um, Ari Aster, uh, have, have taken pieces of what he's done. Um, Orday, I think, is one of the finest uh, passion plays, so to speak, about religious uh, apocalypticism and also uh, 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 cynicism uh, and things like that. Uh, and the it's it's a pastoral film or a pastoral film, or you know, however you define that or however you say it, uh, that is fascinating in its layers. Uh, there's so much to to pick apart, and uh, it's 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 a film that stays with you for a long time. It's one of my favorite films that I studied in film school, and again, in a specific Scandinavian film class that I uh, took with my girlfriend uh, quite a while ago. It was the the first the first uh, four weeks of it were pretty much a dryer intensive or dryer intensive. Uh, the last new pickup that I got before we get to my big announcement so to speak, is this. This also just hit the streets today. This is uh, from Severn Films, their release of Alejandro Jodorowsky's Santa Sagre. 
sent us home bread. I've had a lot of coffee, so my mouth is, my words are kind of thick, I apologize. This is stacked, you know. And I love that Severn Films is really is really coming up with their releases, you know. Um, now, of course, the the primary Jodorowsky films, uh, the influential ones, were released in the Abco Arrow set, El Topo, Holy Mountain, Carmen Release. Uh, but this is one of his later films here, and it, it's, it's just fascinating, much like all of Jodorowsky's films, I'm not going to give too much away, but it's concerned with surrealism, it's concerned with outsiders, it's concerned with um, religious, once again, religious apocalypticism, uh, and it's, it's just fascinating. I actually haven't seen anything past this in his, in his filmography. I haven't seen The Dance of Reality yet, but this has a... Uh, this, this is stacked. It has a feature-length documentary that is new from Severn Films about the making of the film. An audio commentary with Jodorowsky, which is always sure to be interesting because he's a, he, as brilliant as he is, he's a wacko, too, as well. And journalist Alan Jones. We have deleted scenes. We have, for one week only, Alejandro Jodorowsky, which is a 1990 documentary from the UK. Oyo Cardenas, Free Killer, which is a documentary on the real-life inspiration of Santa Sangre. An on-stage Q&A with Jodorowsky, Jodorowsky's an interview from 2003 with him. Simon Boswell interviews Jodorowsky. Blink Jodorowsky, which is a short by Simon Boswell. Close Your Eyes, a music video by Simon Boswell. And E-Check, an Aiden Jodorowsky short film with optional commentary and theatrical trailers. This, this is stacked, stocked, you know. If you are a Jodorowsky fan, and he is, of course, an acquired taste for many reasons, but if you are, if you have acquired that taste, I would definitely suggest that you pick it up. It isn't too much on Amazon, and uh, it's it's a brilliant film. So, there's that. Um, now, now here comes the fun part of all of this. I pulled a little sneaky on you, so to speak. Um, this is an official, so to speak, announcement for uh, the... For the Reddit and the Facebook peoples uh, that watch my videos, um, I make these videos because I love film, and I love film because I am a filmmaker. And in that way, my announcement is this: uh, I am making a film, and I need your help with it. Uh, we are in an early stage of pre-production right now, uh, and I would love it if y'all would contribute. Uh, to the Indiegogo campaign page that I'm going to leave a link to right below here. Briefly, I'll give you a run-through of this film and what it is. Hopefully it catches your fancy, and hopefully the stuff that's on the Indiegogo page will also catch it fancy enough for uh, for you to perhaps throw us $5 or $10 your way, or our way. This film is called I Cannot Forgive. It is a straight-ahead, straightforward revenge thriller, but with a certain different perspective. Uh, it is a film that is very concerned with trauma, with uh, mental instability. It is concerned with sex trafficking. It is concerned with the foster care system. And it is concerned with Austin, Texas, which is where uh, I live. It's where so many of the people and the places that have inspired what this story is live. Uh, in its own way, I hope that it's a dark showcase for the possibilities still that are in Austin, Texas, for filmmaking. And it's also, I hope, with the way that I want to make this thing, which is as rigorously guerrilla as possible in both philosophy and aesthetic, I hope that it's also... It can hopefully inspire people to realize that we can still... We can still make uh, great films here in Austin, Texas. Texploitation, so to speak, in the same vein as Richard Linklater, Robert Rodriguez, and even from my hometown, Dallas, Shane Carruth. Um, so, with that being said, I'll tell you what we have going on right now. Uh, I am happy to announce that playing the lead role of Elisa Johnson, Elisha Johnson, uh, is Miss Alicia Hackney. And in about a month, we're going to be shooting a proof of concept for this film. That will be shown, hopefully, to private investors and uh, other people who are relevant. And then also it will be available on the Indiegogo page so you can see what it is we have going on. Uh, 
our producer, who will go unnamed at this particular moment, um, is currently busy acquiring props, locations, and looking for people who will be willing to give us larger chunks of money who might be interested. We have uh, concept art that's been provided by Tiffany Evans and a few other artists, uh, and they're all fantastic. You'll be able to find those at the Indiegogo page as well, so you can see what the aesthetic of this film is. Uh, if you do contribute, I want to say thank you very much in advance. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on for about four and a half years now. I put about as much thought into it as I possibly can to get it up and running, and now we're just trying to go straight ahead. And I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, it's not going to be a self-referential sort of thing. Uh, this is an earnest effort. Uh, I hope you wouldn't expect anything less from somebody who has this many <laughs> criterion films. Uh, so what I really hope from this film uh, is that it's a core example of the stuff that I'm always talking about as, you know, emblematic of what makes a good film. Uh, visual storytelling, a simple narrative, strong emotions, uh, visceral action sequences, set pieces, uh, character conveyed through, you know, character and emotion conveyed through those set pieces. All those things that I'm always talking about, blathering on about, like, you know, core tenets of great filmmaking. Well, now I want to see if I can do it. You know, I've cerebrated about this for a very, very long time. This is the first time that I'll ever be directing a feature film myself. Uh, it's not a conventional feature film, nor is it a conventional production, but I'm very excited about it, and I hope that you all enjoy it sincerely. Uh, I'm a little terrified, but we're going to see how this comes out. Uh, my fingers are crossed that it goes well. And thank you very much in advance for your support. Your money will be going uh, to pre-production costs, and the closer that we get to shooting the film, they'll be going towards things like paying uh, for props, for locations, for uh, paying actors, things like that, you know, uh, for scheduling, uh, and for, you know, generally just um, making this thing run as smooth as it possibly can with the low budget that we have, which is by design. You can find a fuller explanation for what your money will be going for on the Indiegogo page. Thank you very much.